Um, today, I wanted to share with people about how on May 1st this year, the first batch of 20 Tibetan nuns began sitting for the fourth and final exam for the Geshe Ma degree at uh, Garden Chilling Nunnery in Dharamsala, India. And this is really a historic moment because until four years ago, only monks were allowed to sit for this Geshe degree. And that's the equivalent of a PhD in Tibetan Buddhist philosophical studies. And it's thanks to the encouragement of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and many, many different parties have been working towards this for a long time, so that it's actually coming to pass now. You know, this first batch of 20 nuns who've worked really hard are going to get the degree this year. I think it's really something to rejoice in, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. And just to reflect on all the conditions that have had to come together for this to happen, I mean, from the side of the nuns, First, they have to study five great canonical texts. That's what all the Tibetan Buddhist monastics in India are studying. And they, it's, uh, it takes 17 years to study these texts. There's a lot of memorization. They spend at least four hours a day, I would think, studying, memorizing, debating. And only after that can they sit for the exams. They're spread out over four years. Um, each set of exams lasts for something like 12 days and it's split into written and oral. So the oral debates are really intense. I'm, sh I'm not sure if you've seen that online, but it's one-to-one. -one. Um, I think the person uh, asking is standing, or you know, someone sitting, someone standing. Right. Yeah, the challenger and defender. And what I do know is that you start by drawing a quote out of like a box or something. And the first thing is you have to read out the quote and you have to identify where it comes from in the scriptures. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't even get past that part, right? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that begins the debate. Yeah. Then you start to explain the quote and you debate the quote and, you know, and it goes on for a while. So they have to do this one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> all, um, all the people taking the exam each year. And they have new subjects added on. They have to study science with zero background in science and they're learning things like neuroscience, DNA, you know, from scratch. And they also have to take exams in Tibetan history and language. And this is just the curriculum. Yeah, this is a refugee community. All the nuns have, I mean, the, either they've been born in India or they've escaped from Tibet and gone through the whole trauma of, you know, walking through the hills and risking their lives. And they've had to adjust to life in India. They might be separated from their families. All of them have been involved in building monasteries from scratch. Uh, there's poor sanitation. Venerable Jigme and I have been to Jangchip Chiling Nunri in the south where they have a perennial water problem. For a long time, they would shower by going out when it rained <laughs> or just all going to the same river and trying their best. I think they showed us their one hand pump that was totally rusted. You know, but um, interestingly, they now have water. It came about after they did a very big puja and then they found water nearby. <laughs> a puja is like a big prayer session <laughs> and they found water after that. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, also they're women. So they get less resources, both in, as lay women in terms of education and as nuns. A lot of the best resources are still going to the monks first. And in this regard, I think a lot of Western organizations have done a lot for the Tibetan nuns. Uh, when we were at Jangchup Chiling, I was very inspired to meet a volunteer named Mr. Paul. He's from Germany. He's connected with uh, the, the, the Tibetan Center in Hamburg. And they have had a dedicated group of volunteers who've been supporting the nuns for decades, doing things like fundraising so they could get enough housing, um, building debate courtyards for them, what I was very impressed by is that he goes down every year to check on these projects and he personally goes and petitions for the nuns to get good teachers. Um, for a while they were saying things like, oh, we can't send the teachers to the nunnery, there's no car to pick the teachers up. So he fundraises for cars, right? they get the cars. Uh, oh, you know, if the teachers come here, they need special meals. Okay, they'll fundraise and build a special kitchen. You know, just bringing all these conditions together to overcome all these obstacles so that the nuns can get teachings. So I was just very moved by their dedication to do this over decades. Um, another organization that's worked very hard for the nuns is uh, Tibetan Nuns Project. They have a great website. Um, and I wanted to share this short story that appeared in their newsletter last year of one of the nuns who's taking the exams this year. Not the fourth exam, but you know, she's in the middle of it. And I think it will give you a sense of what each of these nuns has gone through to come to this achievement. So the story is titled, A Long Journey to an Amazing Result. Uh, and it's a story of a nun named Venerable Losang Doka. So born into a simple family in eastern Tibet, Losang Doka became a nun in her teens. With no opportunity to study, she spent her days in household chores and tending livestock. Being a nun meant reciting mantras and doing prostrations. When her brother married, she became free to make a pilgrimage to Lhasa, where she made friends with another nun. 
They decided to go to India to attend the 1990 Kala Chakra being given by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They were caught twice crossing into Nepal and handed back to the Chinese. Their third attempt was successful. Yeah, just reading this gave me pause because, you know, for us, it's easy to go to the teachings where you get on a plane, you go. Like, you don't have to risk arrest and have the determination to keep going back. So finally, they made it to India. And Lo Sang Joka had not planned to stay in India, but her friend convinced her it was no use returning to Tibet, and they should instead enroll in the newly founded nunnery Dolma Ling. She is among the first batch of nuns who entered the study program and at the same time helped with its construction. It was a joyous moment in 1994 when they moved into newly constructed rooms and had a home in India. Sadly, she did not see her parents again. They passed away two years ago. And here too, just to know, I mean, it's not like they have high-tech uh, equipment. I remember seeing the nuns building things and it's just like sending 30 people out with a bunch of ho back ho uh, like digging holes and, you know, it's just sheer human effort to get things going and passing things by hand. So to imagine that they've all built their monasteries that way. Um, so when Lo Sang Joka began her studies, it was hard for her to grasp what was being taught since she had no previous education, but she never gave up. She feels that the opportunity to earn the Geshe Ma degree is very special and is grateful to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his continuous support of nuns' education. Access to this degree encourages nuns to persevere. Lo Sang says that in the beginning she was very scared to sit the Geshe Ma exams, but she never thought of backing out because she did not want younger nuns to accept failure without trying hard for their degree. In May, she successfully passed year two of the four-year exams. All being well, she will be a Geshe Ma in 2017. So looking back on how far she has come, Lo Sang appreciates the importance of education and is grateful to all the teachers and staff for their dedication to the nuns. So I think these nuns are just going to have such a great impact on other younger nuns. Not only that, also on the lay people. Um, one of Venerable Children's teachers was saying that he already hopes to invite some of the nuns to go to his very rural hometown to teach the lay community there. So, you know, they're just going to have this huge ripple effect. Um, this year, it's 44 of them taking the exams, 20 in their final year, and hopefully more and more to come. And I guess this just made me reflect on how, you know, if as a society, if we construct, buy into systems where we give more privileges to one group than another over a long time, everybody loses out. You know, there's just a lot of untapped human potential. And this just shows what can happen when we start giving opportunities to everyone equally. <laughs>